Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We, uh, we love families here. I don't know if any of you noticed over here we had our own little children's mosh pit. <laughs> it's just so beautiful seeing the kids dancing and singing, putting their hands in there. It's just such a beautiful moment. We love families. We love children. And so today we're doing something special with the Tav family. And so Patrick... <sighs> uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm a moment of, a moment of, I, I don't know if any of you have noticed this, um, all females, <laughs> one male, Patrick, you're the man, <laughs> and Tara, you are one of the most creative people I've ever met, and uh, you're just an awesome mom, and you have an incredible family, Rachel and Kaya, you guys are so cute, and now you have two sisters, two more sisters. And today we're going to do something called a dedication in which we as a community, we come together and we pray over them and we thank the Lord for them and we bless them as a community. And so Ellie and Kenzie are our two twins. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, good. Which one is which? This is Kenzie. Kenzie and that's Ellie? Kenzie has a pink bow. Oh, okay. Kenzie has a pink bow. Danielle and I are going to hold them. And I just want to say this real quick. This doesn't mean we get to have one. Okay. (laughs) We don't need another one. Okay. Yeah, that was my fear. That was my fear. Letting her hold. Oh, that's how you ended up with twins. All right, perfect, fantastic. So I'm gonna hold one of them. This is Kenzie. Oh, Kenzie, you are so beautiful. Oh. So we're just gonna walk around. I want to introduce you. And Danielle, why don't you walk on that side? And uh, we're just gonna introduce you to your new family. So this is Kenzie. This is Kenzie. So you guys, why don't you say hi to Kenzie? Here's our camera crew. Yeah, say hello. She's looking too. She's like, who are y'all? Can you say hi? Yeah, some of the guys over here are like, oh, great, babies. No, that's your baby. No. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. you got your baby. Can you say hello? Look at all these beautiful people. This is your fam, bam. It's Carlos. He makes some good coffee in the morning. Yeah, you probably won't need that until you're 30 and you're not getting any sleep. <laughs> yeah, this is your family. Say hi. Oh, so cute. Say hello. And so, as a church today, we're going to take some time and pray over you. Not just that you get some sleep. <laughs> But that these beautiful little souls will continue to know God and walk in paths of life and righteousness and truth. And so we're going to bring up some of our leaders. So uh, if you're a leader here for service, just come on up and we're going to lay some hands on you. And we're going to pray together. And parents, please, uh, uh, grandparents, come on up. Anyone related to the Taft family, please come on up. And uh, we're just going to pray over you guys. There we go. All right. Hey, I'm doing okay. She's not crying. (laughs) They're they're pretty chill. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. (laughs) Anyone could. (laughs) Oh, good. Good That's what I want to hear. Yeah. Good job, Tony. So, so let's, uh, let's lay, lay hands on this amazing family and we're going to say a prayer together. God, we thank you so much for this family. And Lord, right now, we pray a special blessing over Patrick. (laughs) And Lord, he has the opportunity to help raise four amazing little girls. And Lord, we ask that you will give him strength and sleep and patience. Let him be the kind of dad the little girl finds her value and beauty. And let him tell them every day how wonderful they are and that they have a daddy that loves them. God, I thank you for Terry. I pray you will give her more and more amounts of energy that even coffee can't give her. (laughs) And Lord, I pray you'll give her patience and love and let it just spill over everywhere she goes. We thank you that she's doing such incredible work with kids all over, but especially these ones here. Let her have so much patience and love and let her creativity spill over into her children's lives. We thank you for their two sisters, Kaya and Rachel. And Lord, let them know that there is enough love in the family for everybody. Let them begin to share that love with their new sisters. And Lord, 
please, please let us as a community learn to embrace this family. So today with Ellie and with Kenzie, we want to thank you and pray that you will bless them in tremendous ways. Lord, whatever direction they go with their lives and their careers, we pray that you will let them be a beacon of hope and life more abundantly to everyone they touch. And Lord, as a community, let us be there to help them, mentor them, give them life and love, good examples of how to walk in that life. We thank you for these two beautiful little girls. And as a community, we want to raise them up to you and bless them. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you're here to support this family, raise your hand. There are all of your babysitters. <laughs> Call on each one of them when it's time for date night. Give them one more big hand. <laughs> we love you guys. And uh, we are here on this journey with you. <laughs> Isn't it cool to look around and see so many families, so many young families here? Every time we do sermons, one of them, one of the little, little children will sometimes lose it. And I think, what a blessing, right? What a blessing to have kids and families in church. It's powerful as a community. We've been moving through Exodus. And we understand that the story of Exodus, what the Israelites have been through, we can also find beautiful applications for us as well. And so, 10 curses or 10 blessings. If I told you I wanted you to create a civilization and rules in which to guide it, what would you do? What would your civilization, your group look like? What kind of values and rules would you use? I would say, well, Tony gets 50% uh, of your income. <laughs> Um, you might create some really interesting rules if you're only focused on you. But if you're focused on the betterment of the community, well, you might have some interesting ideas and, and concepts to bring to the whole. And so Israel is leaving slavery, and they're asking the question, how do we navigate life now? I have a friend. He's a grandfather now. And his, uh, his grandkids... They were talking about this place called Burning Man, an event in the, the, I guess, the middle of the desert somewhere. And his kids were saying, it sounds so fun. There's so much art and this and this and this. I'm not promoting Burning Man by bringing it up. Please understand. <laughs> but he listened and he thought, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go. He's over 70. I'm going to go. And so he went. And he said, sure enough, there are some things there that he thought, ooh, all right. Not my thing. Not my thing. But he said there were other elements of Burning Man that kind of surprised him. He said as he was walking through some of the tents, people would stop and they would ask him to join them in eating whatever food they were eating. Never once asked for anything in return. He said all week long, he just kind of walked around and people invited him in. Never asked him, what do you believe? Who are you? What's your past? What's your occupation? They just invited him in. And I found out one of the values of this group is that they value radical inclusion. And I thought that's kind of interesting. One of their mottos, now get this, as Christians, we should smile about this. One of them is, everyone's welcome around the table. Interesting, right? Also, when they leave, they leave the place as good, if not better, than when they left it. That's the goal, I guess. Interesting. Some of the rules they created around their group. How many of you have ever heard of the U.S. Constitution? You should. <laughs> it's kind of important. As a, as a country, our forefathers came together and said, how do we now live in freedom? What are the things that we should value? So they started, we the people, we believe this and this and this. All men are created equal. Now, as we have moved and grown into a deeper awareness of life, we've started to ask some questions. What does it mean all men are created equal? What about women? And we've begun to create these amendments to this, and we've made it bigger, and it's more, more encompassing. 
It's a beautiful document. There's some people right now that have decided they're going to try to create floating islands. 60 miles out from sea, they want to do this so that they're not connected to a country. They have all of the expenses ready. They are at the place where they can start building any time. The problem is none of them can agree on a way to govern their island. Isn't that funny? That's happening right now. How you govern, how you decide to live and navigate is so important. And so for Israel, they said, how do we navigate this new reality? What do we do? What do we value? And that's what they're doing when they get to Mount Sinai. Again, a mountain, a place where there's expectancy. Something big is going to happen here. Every time mountains come into the picture in the story, there's always something powerful that's going to take place. And so, I feel like this is not quite working. There we go. And so, let's stay there. So they get to the, uh, they get to the bottom there of Mount Sinai. They're waiting at the foot of the, the mountain. And sure enough, Moses' father-in-law shows up. Husbands, don't you love when father-in-law show up? They show up and they say, huh, I would have done that a little differently. Am I right? Huh, you using a, using a hammer on that? Okay. It's your cabinet. Jethro shows up. Jethro sees how they have been ordering things. He sees Moses. And every single conflict that comes goes right to Moses. And Moses deals with every single one. How many of you think that's a great recipe for disaster? Yeah. Leadership that takes on every single conflict, every single problem. You know what happens to them? They retire. (laughs) You're exhausted. It's exhausting. And that's why you have all these great books right now on leadership that say, learn to empower people, find talents, help people bring something to the table, empower them. And Jethro says to him, the work you're doing is too heavy. There's too much for one person to do. And so he says to Moses, he says, select capable men. And I would argue in our culture, select capable men, women, teenagers, children, Select capable people of doing certain things. I was so proud of our church. Most of our nominating committee this year was made up of a bunch of new people, many teenagers. Can you believe that? Teenagers said, we want to be a part of nominating committee. Come on, that's weird. We have some weird young, young adults here. But that, they said, we, we're invested. We want to be a part of it. And so... Select these people, empower them to do great things. Moses chooses to do this, and we have our first judicial system set up for Israel. Moses is then told, go to the mountain. There's going to be a covenant between God and his people. The word covenant, barit, it means it's it's a signed document or, or this agreement between someone and someone else. So if I was an empire and I took over your empire, here's what I would do. I would sign Barit. And I would say, here's the new way you're going to order things. It could be better or it could be worse. And so this is the idea historically behind a covenant, Barit. And what happens there is Moses says, take three days. Take three days to consider your journey and our journey as a people. And after you do that, we're going to make some commitments to each other. I'm learning it's important sometimes to stop and take time to consider your journey. Three days is always synonymous with a process of death and rebirth over and over and over again in Scripture. And so the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to reconsider, reevaluate my journey. And I've had to say, what am I committed to? And so I'm going to share with you my three main commitments. My first commitment is this. I want to be a great father and husband. 
That's my first commitment. And so everything I do, I want to try to make everything I do fall within that commitment. The second commitment I've decided I want to be committed to. I want to learn to be a grounded individual in the middle of nominating committee, (laughs) in the middle of conflict, in the middle of whatever it is. I want to learn to be a grounded, centered person. Thirdly, I want to learn to be the kind of person that loves growth spiritual, educational, physical. And I'm not talking about this growth because that seems to be happening a lot to me lately. Growth. I want to be someone that embraces it. And so what I'm going to be doing this week, and here's my challenge to you. I want you to take a, a, a dry erase marker. I hope you heard that part so no mothers are angry with me. Take a dry erase marker. I want you to take time, consider your commitments. Write three commitments On your mirror, your bathroom mirror this week, write three of them. And I want you all throughout the week to write down uh, on my Facebook wall or the, or OC Grace first wall, write down what your commitments were and how that's going. How many of you can do that this week? Five of us. Fantastic. (laughs) Here's the deal, guys. We can come together and we can hear sermons and great music, but if we walk away and we're not challenged and we're not actually walking in it, then it was just a show. So please do this with me today. If you heard nothing else, go home. Think about your journey. What are you committed to? Write it down. Here's the beauty of writing it down now. My wife is going to see my commitments. Tony, that, was, that, wasn't, that doesn't sound like you're very grounded today in that conflict. It's beautiful. Now you've got some accountability. Three days. Consider your commitments. And so the Ten Commandments. Moses goes up Mount Sinai. He's given the Ten Commandments. Beautiful blessings of how to navigate life. Here's the beautiful thing about the Ten Commandments. The word translated, we've called it Ten Commandments. That's not actually the Hebrew. The Hebrew is Aser Dehat Derevim. And this phrase means Ten holy words. The word words means breath. So I want you to think about this when you think about the Ten Commandments, because I'm sure you've never thought about this before. Think about someone who is just drowned. They pull the body out, and someone breathes life into them. The ten holy words are breath God is giving. A body or a person who is near drowning would not be like, No, please! I'll be fine. I'll be fine. No, it's just breathed. These things in these 10 holy words are things we learn and they become natural. 10 holy breaths are given. And the 10 holy breaths, what's beautiful about this is it's broken up into three parts. The first three is all about what you value, what you worship, how you worship. The fourth revolves around how to stay in that place of reminding yourself you're not a slave. Five through ten, all about how to live in peace together. Let me share with you. There we go. Blessing one. Have no other gods before me. I think this one's really beautiful and crucial. For them, they were worshiping God in really gross ways. They were worshiping pagan gods. You would bring your eldest son to the sacrifice and sacrifice them. They were getting caught up in some of this pagan worship because here's the thing. God, Israel's God, was a God that brought life and order from chaos. The other practices, the other gods brought chaos to life. So what you worship, how you worship God will either bring you more chaos or more life. And this follows. Don't worship images made in your image. For some of us, we've turned God into a gun-toting Republican or a tree-hugging liberal. Have I offended everybody yet in the room? Um, An oddly weird libertarian. (laughs) I think I got all of you. Beautiful. (laughs) We oftentimes make God in our image. The beauty of this breath that's been breathed, 
Don't worship self. Worship God who is life, who is our very breath. When you begin to place yourselves above everything else, you begin to worship tiny little idols of yourself. And it gets kind of weird. Empires that worship themselves and their power, they push others out. Not everyone fits in that kind of system. Don't worship images made of your, made, it made in your image. I love church. I love this service. I actually really like being a Seventh Adventist. I think there's a lot of beauty to it. We're weird, aren't we? But I don't worship the church. I don't worship our 28 fundamentals. But I do appreciate them. And I've learned to value what we have. But I don't worship the church. I worship the God who is above the church. May we be those kind of people in arguments and frustrations with one another. You said something I don't fully agree with. Okay. Who do you serve? I serve a God that's above it all. If we don't agree, we can love each other and we can grow together. It's beautiful. Number two, number three, you shall not falsely swear by God's name. How many of you ever heard people say this and you cringed? How many of you said it and you had your parents whack you over the head? <laughs> Do not use the Lord's name in vain. Right? <laughs> you know that actually has very little to do with what this commandment is about. Here's what this commandment for the Hebrews meant. God is holy and mysterious. And once you begin to put God in boxes... You are no longer aware of the mystery. For them, they understood the poets and the prophets. They did their very best to describe God. But they understood. If you say God is a father, well, that sounds great if your father has been a loving father who has been there. But what of the kid in the inner city who's not had a father there? God is an absentee father. A mother, what of the mother who gave you up and didn't want anything to do with you or, or treated you poorly? Well, all of these metaphors, they break down at some point. And for the Hebrews, their point was God is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. And we can argue day and night of what we think God looks like. No, I swear he's a middle-aged white man up there on a cloud. God is a she. We do our best. And at the end of the day, we say, God is so good and so much bigger than we can ever imagine. That's how the Hebrews viewed number three. Then number four, how many of you love having the Sabbath to look forward to every week? <laughs> Me too. I didn't always appreciate that. <laughs> I grew up in the, uh, on the East Coast, the remnant. We kept Sabbath better than you crazy Western people, <laughs> West Coast liberals. I remember getting a bunch of extra rules and regulations surrounding this day. I remember you couldn't do this and this and this. But then I would also see my parents and other adults, and there were some inconsistencies. See, f for me, growing up in the East Coast, my parents would say, you cannot spend money on the Sabbath. Don't go out to eat. Unless you were on vacation. <laughs> you can't spend money. But then we would go to the zoo. And I'd see my dad like, you know how it goes. He's kind of, take it, take it. Do you want your change? Just go. <laughs> we started calling my dad out. Well, it's, it's nature, Tony. Sometimes you got to pay for nature. <laughs> got it. Got it. I remember some of my friends, my good Christian, good Ventus friends, they, I heard stories about they would be driving in their car. And of course, like, don't ever talk to them about, well, why didn't you just fill it up on Friday? That's not part of their story. The needle's on E. And I heard, I hear these stories of my friends. They would be like, we just prayed to God. And there was this beautiful holy wind that just blew our car for another 60 miles. Good on you. 
so, so, some of my friends in high school, we had that same problem. And we prayed. And we ended up in the middle of the upper peninsula with no gas. <laughs> and one of our fathers had to come and fill up the tank. <laughs> and I remember being like, wow, how does this work? Are they, does God listen to them better because they observe the day better than me? What, what is the deal? And then I began to understand the beauty of this day. The beauty of Sabbath was that it is a day in which you stop and you remind yourself, I am not a slave. I'm not a machine that works every single day, day in and day out. I'm made for something so much bigger. And so on that day, I'm slowly learning because I put it in my commitment to put my phone away or at least not within reaching distance because really it doesn't matter what you just ate today on your Instagram. It shouldn't. I should be fully present with my family. You should be more alive today than any other day in the week because you have the freedom to do so. That's Sabbath. What a beautiful blessing of a, a, a fresh breath of air. Sabbath. And then we have these other commands, five through 10, how to live together in harmony. Honor your father and mother. Listen to the wisdom of the older generations. Now, here's the deal. When I was a teenager, I was far smarter than my father. Teenagers are just smarter. Just no. As I grew a little bit older, I started to realize, huh, maybe my dad is changing. Wisdom. Seek wisdom. And you, you will learn the wise voices worth, uh, versus the unwise ones. You will learn this. There are wisdom voices. Learn to ask for wisdom. And you honor the tradition. Learn to appreciate life. It's a gift. Honor it by honoring others. Don't commit adultery. Learn to be fully committed to that person. Love them. Cherish them. Don't steal. I'm going to go back to don't steal. <laughs> don't steal. You know what's funny? I've heard these Ten Commandments over and over again. I still get them mixed up. What's number eight? Learn to appreciate what you have, folks. Do you really need the iPhone 10? Oh, I just hit a nerve, didn't I? Some of you are like, yes, I do. So many new features. Learn to appreciate what you have. And when you do that, you are no longer needing to steal and take from other people. You learn to like what you have, enjoy what you have. Don't bear false witness. For this time period, there were many that would take others to court and they would fabricate certain things or there would, there would be really loosely things that didn't quite fit. All because a certain group of people want to hurt another person. And so the idea with don't bear false witness was that you think the best of the person first. And we've actually incorporated this into our judicial system today, haven't we? Guilty. Or <laughs> I feel like that's some... Innocent until what? Yeah. We learn to think the very best of people. And then we come together as a community and we redeem. That was the process. It wasn't to crucify or hurt redeem. Don't covet. Again, learn to appreciate things sometimes without owning them. Here's the beauty of the iPhone 10. Some of you fools are going to buy some. <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy watching you play it and I'm going to borrow it sometimes. <laughs> some of you will buy that nice new truck and I'm going to use it when it's time to move things. I appreciate you owning that thing. I tell you. These 10 beautiful breaths, gifts from God, were meant to bring you freedom. Freedom. They were meant to give you breath. They're not meant to be these rules and regulations that you have to keep. And if you don't keep them, God's going to be angry with you. Not the point of the beautiful breath God's given. The breath enables you to breathe. Consider that. It enables you to breathe fully. 
But some of us, we can oftentimes take these and we can turn them into curses. In my family, my wife, she's very healthy and I love her for it. It's frustrating when you're getting older and you, you know, you muffin top is going. Then you look at your wife and you're like, oh, she still looks the same, maybe better. <laughs> it's hard to keep up. But she, she does these oils and these salves and these other things. And every morning, it's so funny because she will have these vitamins and salves and other things that we put on as a family. It's kind of become a tradition. Did you take your vitamin C? <sighs> no. Did you take that? Put clarity on your forehead, <laughs> whatever it is. And here's the thing. My wife loves us. She wants us to be healthy. And I got to be honest, every time I put that stuff on, it does something good for me. But if I decided I'm only going to, I'm only going to take the pills and do these things to make my wife happy. At some point in time, that relationship is going to break down because I'm not doing it in order for me to feel wholeness, to be healthy. I'm doing it just to appease her. And at some point, I'm going to get frustrated with the pills and the oils and the fragrance. <laughs> and at some point, I'm going to begin disliking my lovely wife. I might even start making extra rules and regulations. When you take these pills, you're going to have to take a whole cup of uh, apple cider vinegar. How's that? And then you're going to have to smile. And then after taking them, you're going to have to sleep all day. Right? If I do that with these beautiful gifts, it has the potential to absolutely ruin relationship. And I will at some point in time simply stop taking them. So the beauty of this, these 10 breaths God has given, is that we simply have to do this. When he gives it, we go like this. <sighs> Breathe it in. Breathe it in. They are gifts to us to learn how to navigate fully in this life. They are freedom gifts. Israel was learning how to walk in freedom. And so today on the Sabbath day, a day that was specifically made for you and me, reminding us we're not machines, I want you to put away your cell phone for a few minutes, spend time with your family and friends, if you're at the beach and you're in a suit, you're in the wrong place. Let me just say that much. Take off the suit. Enjoy the beach. Enjoy the family. Go on a hike. Do something together. Enjoy really good food. Spend time together. Every one of these beautiful gifts is just that. It's a gift. And my prayer for you and I as Seventh-day Adventists, who pride ourselves on knowing these, may we begin to walk fully in them, breathing them to everyone we meet, sharing that kind of beautiful life that God has breathed out for us to breathe in. May you do that today and experience real freedom like the Israelites did.